Step 8. While the boards will come to us, we can draw up a circuit based on the board. I see no point in commenting on this boring process. The work is long and requires great care. I'm an old person at heart and I hardly use newfangled programs and simulators. Therefore, I create a circuit using the good old program as plan. Step 9. Transformer manipulation. This is an intermediate process during which the transformer is disassembled, the magnetic permeability of the core is measured, the full dimensions and parameters of the windings are measured, all data are recorded, then all assembled back. The transformer has three windings. The two primaries in our circuit are connected to the midpoint. The shoulders are completely equal. In the secondary winding, high voltage is generated. Before disassembling, I measure the inductance of the windings just in case. The secondary has an inductance of 14.5 millihenry. The primary is 97 to 98 microhenry each. Further disassembled it. The halves of the core are glued together. For 5 minutes, we immerse the core in boiling water. The glue will weaken, then we calmly separate the halves. The windings are wound as follows. The secondary winding is divided on two parts. At the top, part of the secondary is wound. It consists of 18 turns. Wire 0.5 mm. Next comes the insulation and wound first half of the primary winding consisting of three turns with a wire of 0.71 mm in six cores. Then again insulation and comes the second arm of the primary winding. The characteristics are identical to the first arm. Next again isolation. And, at the very end, the other part of the secondary winding was wound on a bare frame. It consists of 46 turns and is wound with the same 0.5 mm wire. Despite the rather high operating frequency of the inverter, manufacturers tried to squeeze all the juice out of this core. The number of turns of the primary winding, taking into account the initial data, should be increased from 3 turns to 4 in each arm. This will reduce the idle current and the circuit will work in a lighter mode. In general, here all the parameters of the factory transformer, including the dimensions and permeability of the core. I calculated the new data of the transformer and will do it my way. There is no necessary wire at hand, so I took a 0.31 mm wire for both the primary and the secondary windings. It will not be worse from this, on the contrary, the quality factor of the transformer will increase. First, the secondary winding is wound. In my case, it will consist of 84 turns, wound with three cores of 0.31 mm wire. Half of this winding, that is 42 turns, is wound on the bare frame. Next comes the insulation and the primary winding is wound. Unlike the Chinese, I wind both parts at the same time to minimize spread. Each arm consists of 18 cores of 0.31 mm wire. The number of turns is 4. We put insulation on top and wind the remaining half of the secondary winding, that is 42 turns in 3 cores, wire of 0.31. Next, we connect the beginning of one half of the secondary winding with the end of the other. That is, we connected the halves of the secondary winding in series. The resulting point isn't used in the circuit in any way. Well, at the end, we solder the ends of the primary winding so that everything is connected according to the circuit, that is, the phasing coincides. It's push-pull circuit. In the center, we connect the beginning of one arm of the primary winding with the end of the other forming the middle point, where the power supply is connected. That's the whole process. The circuit is push-pull, there is no gap between the halves of the core. After all the basic work is done, the diagram is created. Let's look at it. As said earlier, it consists of a power inverter, which raises 12 volts to a high DC voltage and an AC voltage generation unit, which is a conventional H-bridge or H-bridge on high voltage and channel MOSFETs. The converter is classic, built according to the push-pull topology. A pair of powerful MOSFETs acting in turn create a pulse current in the primary winding of the transformer. On the secondary winding, we get an alternating voltage of high frequency, which is rectified by fast diodes and goes to the next node. 
MOSFETs are controlled by the PWM controller TL494 through a primitive driver that ensures reliable locking of the MOSFETs. Driver work. If you look at the internal structure of the TL494, you will see that its output cascade is of an open type. The user himself decides where to connect the transistors of this cascade to ground or to positive. In our circuit, pins 8 and 11 are the collectors of the internal transistors and connected to the positive power supply. That is, when the internal transistors are triggered, the microcircuit will switch plus. This plus appears at pins 9 and 10 coming to the basis of external low-power transistors which are the gate driver. How does it work? When a plus appears at the output of the microcircuit, the driver transistor will not open because it is PNP structure. Therefore, the signal through the diode will go to the gate of the MOSFET and it will work. At a low level, at the output of the PWM microchip, which equal to nothing at the output, a pull-up resistor will come into play. The necessary level signal from resistor goes to the base of the control transistor. It will work and through its open transition, the MOSFET gate will be shunted to ground. This will completely discharge the residual capacity of the MOSFET gate and the FET switch will reliably close. This is important because when the second MOSFET is triggered, the first must be completely closed, otherwise they may burn out. The same process is gone in the case of the second MOSFET. Next, the high voltage of high frequency from the secondary winding of the pulse transformer is rectified by fast diodes and smoothed by an electrolyte. After that, this power is supplied to the bridge from four high voltage fats. First, one pair of fat is triggered, then they closed. There is a short pose and another pair is triggered, then again a pose and a further in a circle. I will not explain the work in detail, but it doesn't differ much from the work of the first part. So, the constant voltage turns into an alternating one, though into rectangles and not into a sign. The frequency of these operations is set by the second PWM controller TL494. Its frequency setting circuit is rated at 100 Hz, but as a result, the frequency is halved. Reverse polarity protection is very simple. At the 12 volt input, there is a powerful FAT. If you connect the power incorrectly, then a mass will connect to its gate and it simply will not open. The switch will not noticeably heat up, it will be completely open. Here the IRF3205 is used and it has an open channel resistance of 8 milliohms. Considering the power of the inverter and the maximum input current of about 20 amperes, only about 3 to 3.5 watts will be released on the transistor in the form of heat. And this, as you understand, is about nothing. About 10 days passed and boards came up to us, a batch of 5 pieces. Nice, high quality and quite cheap. Now let's go to business. We take out our box with components and solder all SMD components, preferably under a microscope. Next, we clean the board and solder all components with pins, and at the very end the transformer wires and terminals. The beauty is clearly not worse than original from China. Now we smear thermal grease on the substrates of the power switches, use thermal spacers and install the inverter in the Chinese case. We do all this, of course, after a thorough check of all connections and component ratings. In fact, each node is tested separately before complete assembly. We just have to check the result of many days of painstaking work. One little carelessness when copying, one small mistake and all the work down the drain. First, on the laboratory power supply we limit the current to the level of half an ampere so that in case of something it doesn't blast. We start it and the indicator light seems to light up. The buzzer beeps, then everything is fine. The output voltage is also available, which is good news. Now we carry out all the tasks that we did at the beginning. Low voltage protection. Over voltage protection. Short circuit protection. Output voltage and frequency. Output waveform. And the last thing. Let's measure the output power and efficiency. I load device with this assembly of resistors. The current clamp will show the output current. 
This multimeter will show the output voltage and the other will show the input voltage, which is now 13 volts. The first indicator of the laboratory power supply will show the input current. That is, these two will show everything at input and these two everything at the output. So let's start! 24 amps consumes at the input. Voltage 13.1. Output voltage 200. Output current 1.27 amps. Power and efficiency are now on your screens. Everything works fine. The inverter holds the load. Almost everything is the same as the Chinese copy, or rather our copy has everything the same as the Chinese original, and something even better, for example, a lower idle current. By the way, the efficiency of the inverter is about the same as that of the Chinese. I do understand that hardly anyone will repeat this design because this requires nerves, a lot of free time, experience with impulse sources, and the ability to solder SMD components. In general, good advice, if you need such type of inverter, it's easier to spend $20 to $30 and buy it. And if purely sports interest, then go for it. This is still an experience in your piggy bank, which is always useful. On this, the video comes to an end. Please rate the invested work with your like or dislike. Share the video with your friends on social nets, if it was useful. Well, perhaps that's all. All necessary files, circuit, board, Gerber, you will find in the archive of the project by the link in the description. See you soon. As always, with you was Kassian TV.